Good afternoon. Let's briefly revise the anatomy of the eyelid. Going from anterior to posterior, the first structure that you see is the skin of the eyelid. The skin is the thinnest in the entire body, below which lies the subcutaneous tissue, which is the second level. The subcutaneous tissue is very loose and therefore it is readily distended either due to edema or due to trauma or due to you know collection of blood. That is why after post-traumatic cases, it is very easy to have bruising and edema of the eyelids. It is because of this loose subcutaneous connective tissue. The next layer below the subcutaneous tissue and the first muscle that you encounter in the eyelid is the orbicularis oculi, which is supplied by the seventh cranial nerve. And a palsy of the seventh cranial nerve produces lag of thalamus. Lag of thalamus is basically an incomplete closure of eyelids. So the upper and the lower eyelids are unable to meet due to a weakness of this orbicularis oculi muscle. Structure number four, is the levator palpebris superioris muscle. It is supplied by the third cranial nerve. The origin is from the orbital apex, which is way back in the orbit, to three structures. It goes and inserts onto the skin of the eyelid, to the tarsal plate, and to the fornicial conjunctiva. So three insertions of the levator palpebris superioris. The fifth structure in yellow is a submuscular areolar tissue. Now this is the layer where all the nerves are present, and that is why local injections or local blocks, local anesthetic blocks, are to be given here. Now the silver structure that you can see, structure number six is the tarsal plate. It is basically a thick and strong fibrous tissue which gives the shape and firmness to the eyelids. It is present in both the upper as well as the lower eyelids and it also contains the mebomian glands. Structure number seven, the gray line that you can see, the long line is called septum orbital or palpebral fascia. Its origin is from the tarsal plate and goes up to the periosteum of the orbit. So it's a very long structure. Structure number eight, the thin red line that you can see in the posterior part of the eyelid is the Muller muscle. It is supplied by the sympathetic nervous system and it is a muscle that originates from the muscle, from another muscle. So in the upper lid, it arises on the levator palpebris superioris and in the lower lid, it arises from the inferior rectus muscle and the insertion is onto the tarsal plate. Notice the small gray square that I have made here marked by an asterisk. It is the intermarginal strip also called the gray line. Roughly it lies between the skin anteriorly and the palpebral conjunctiva posteriorly. So the anterior most structure of the skin is the uh, anterior most structure of the eyelid is the skin and the posterior most is the palpebral conjunctiva. Okay. So coming to entropion itself, it is basically an inward rolling of the eyelid margin. So if you can see the normal structure over here, the eyelashes are pointing pretty much outwards. There's nothing to worry about. However, if you see in a case of entropion, there is an inward rolling of eye margin and not just the margin. It is also the eyelashes that are coming and irritating the cornea in this case. It can happen either in the upper lid or lower lid or both depending on the age group, certain lids are more susceptible to having an entropion. So how do you classify an entropion? You basically classify based on the cause. The first is congenital, which is present since birth. Lower lid is more commonly affected than upper lid. Congenital itself is very rare. However, if it does happen, it will more likely happen in the lower lid as compared to the upper lid. Lower lid, or, uh, lower lid entropion is usually a developmental defect. Whereas upper lid is due to microphthalmos. So when the eyeball is small, there is a loss of mechanical support because of which the lids droop into the eyelid. So they turn inwards because of a loss of mechanical support. There may not be anything wrong with the lid itself. It is a small eyeball that is causing a loss of support. The second type of entropion is psychiatricial, which is scarring basically. It is the most common type of entropion and more likely happens in the upper lid. So anything that can cause scarring in the conjunctiva is going to cause a scarring of the eyelid. It's going to cause psychiatricial entropion. So what are the causes? It could be due to trachoma, membranous conjunctivitis most commonly. Less common causes are pemphigus, chemical injuries and Stevens-Johnson syndrome. The third type of entropion is senile, also called as involutional. So occurs in the elderly and because of a drooping, a weakening of the eyelid uh, due to gravity, the lower lid is more affected as compared to the upper lid. So what are the causes of senile entropion? It is basically a weakening of the structures present in the eyelid itself. Either the orbicularis oculi weakens or the orbicularis oculi is overridden by other muscles, other smaller muscles that are present in the eyelid or the septum orbitale becomes weak, it becomes lax. 
and the fourth and the last kind of entropion is mechanical this is due to a loss of support the eyeball itself is unsupportive because of which the eyelids are not able to maintain its shape and position so can occur in thysis bulbi in ophthalmos micro ophthalmos or after surgical procedures such as enucleation or evisceration so what symptoms is the patient going to present to you with one thing you have to understand is the condition of entropion itself is asymptomatic symptoms are produced because of the rubbing of the cilia or the eyelashes against the cornea and conjunctiva so the certain symptoms that the patient could present with foreign body sensation irritation lacrimation photophobia or if the cornea has been compromised a diminution of vision what signs will you see the very first and the obvious is the interning of the eyelid margins so depending on how much of the lid is ever inverted there are grades to the entropion so this grade 1 2 and 3 grade 1 is only the posterior border of the eyelid as interned grade 2 is grade 1 with an interning of intermarginal septum and grade 3 is grade 2 plus an anterior border of the eyelid also getting inverted so varying stages and severities of entropion secondly you could see some signs of the causative disease for example if there is chemical burns you are going to see scarring you are going to see symblephron formation certain corneal opacity may be present so an evidence of the causative disease what is causing the entropion that could be seen thirdly cornea requires a very specific invest uh, uh, examination then there are four clinical features of the cornea that you have to look for specifically first is a corneal abrasion because of the eyelashes corneal opacity if those abrasions are persistent corneal vascularization again because of a persistent abrasion a non healing ulcer and fourthly an ulceration itself now ulceration in a case of entropion is very very dangerous because ulceration if is happening because of membranous conjunctivitis is very risky because membranous conjunctivitis understand is caused by corynebacterium diphtheriae and staph epidermidis most commonly and if you remember our corneal ulcer lecture corynebacterium diphtheriae is one of the organisms that penetrates intact cornea so even if there is no epithelial abrasion no epithelial defect you could still have a corneal ulceration due to membranous conjunctivitis just as a side note the other organisms that penetrate an intact cornea both the nizeri gonorrhea and nizeri meningitis hemophilus influenzae and listeria species how do you treat entropion it is basically a surgical line of management there is absolutely no medical treatment for entropion if it is a case of congenital entropion the first thing that you could do is wait and watch for 6 months because many a times this condition regresses on its own if it is of the congenital variety as the eyelid develops it becomes less and less entropic and it gets you know recovered on its own however if it doesn't recover something called hots procedure can be done in which basically 4 mm away from the lid margin on the inferior eyelid you make an incision into the skin and the subcutaneous muscle the orbicularis oculi muscle you remove a section of the skin and the orbicularis oculi muscle and pass an 80 nylon suture along the wound such that when you suture the eyelid has to be forcibly pulled anteriorly it has to come it has to bow anteriorly such that the entropion gets corrected and now the eyelashes are directing outwards so this is the hots procedure in a case of psychiatrical entropion yeah okay uh, the first procedure you can do is anterior lamella resection so what you are basically doing is when i say anterior lamella i basically mean the skin and the orbicularis oculi muscle anything other than that is not is the posterior lamella so when i am saying anterior lamella resection i make an incision at the posterior border of the anterior lamella which means at the posterior border of the orbicularis oculi muscle as shown by the green arrow along with that i also excise a part of the skin and the orbicularis oculi muscle about 3 mm away from the lid margin when i pass the suture again the eyelid has to move anteriorly and the entropion gets corrected It, the suturing is done in two layers the first layer is done by the 60 vicryl and the skin closure is done by 60 nylon the problem with anterior lamella resection is it can only be done for mild degrees of case, mild cases or mild degrees of entropion because understand you are removing some amount of tissue so too much tissue cannot be removed only mild cases such as grade 1 can be corrected secondly the anterior lamella may migrate even after surgery in case of an incomplete closure or if the suture is loose thirdly scarring is a very bad complication of this surgery hence cosmesis if the patient desires cosmesis it cannot be performed the next procedure is tarsal wedge resection in which a wedge 
of the skin so orbicularis oculi muscle and the tarsal plate is done suturing is again done in the same fashion such that the eyelid now turns outwards this can be utilized for moderate degrees the next procedure is called transposition of tarso conjunctival wedge the, the other name is modified ketsky's procedure in which basically this surgery is done from the conjunctival side the other surgeries are done from the outer the skin part whereas the first layer that you will cut in this surgery is the conjunctiva the palpebral conjunctiva a horizontal incision is made about 2 mm from the lid margin along a region called sulcus subtarsalis subtarsalis sulcus subtarsalis is basically a landmark on the palpebral part of the conjunctiva and this procedure involves a tarsal fracture which means i am making a full thickness incision into the tarsal plate so i am fracturing the tarsus and everting matter sutures when placed will again pull the eyelid outwards and the entropion gets corrected this can be utilized for mild to moderate degrees of entropion and finally in severe cases where either previous therapy has not helped or if if it's a grade 3 entropion then posterior lamellar graft can be taken in which you replace the conjunctiva and the tarsal plate itself the conjunctiva is replaced by using a conjunctival autograft or a mucous membrane from from some other part say for example from the soft palate and the tarsal plate is replaced by using donor sclera which is a pre preserved sclera from some other individual the ear cartilage or the hard palate so a replacement of tissue is done and posterior lamellar graft is performed suppose it is a case of senile entropion so understand that senile will be utilized more in the lower lid because lower lid it is more common first is a temporary procedure called transverse everting sutures so the concept is that you closely pack all the lid layers because of which scarring will happen and when scarring happens there is some amount of fibrosis which will cause an eversion of the eyelid secondly because you are closely packing all the lid layers there is no overriding of the orbicularis oculi muscle no other muscle can come over and cause an entropion for this muscle because now you are closely packing all the lids the next procedure is called wies procedure and it is a type of permanent procedure the first thing you do in wies procedure is you make an incision from the skin side you involve the skin the orbicularis oculi muscle and the tarsal plate along the whole eyelid about 3 mm away from the lid margin then a mattress suture is passed from the lower border of the tarsus to the lid margin about 1 mm away from the lid margin so consequently when i tighten this suture there is going to be an eversion of the eyelid so understand the vector forces that are acting here if i am putting an oblique suture such as shown in the red line over here when i tighten the suture the entire lid margin is going to come outwards and again here you are hoping that there is some amount of fibrosis which prevents an overriding of the orbicularis oculi muscle next proce procedure is called jones procedure in which you basically plicate the mus the muscular layer so think in terms of squint surgery so if you want to strengthen a muscle in squint surgery you will produce a muscle resection you will shorten the muscle similar concept is applied over here in which severe or recurrent cases can be treated by this procedure in which the lower lid retractors are shortened and sutures so when you want to strengthen a muscle you will shorten and suture out the muscle the last procedure is called quickert procedure although the name is quickert it is absolutely not quick because it involves two procedures done in the same sitting the first is the wies procedure which was previously discussed along with that quickert is done if there is a horizontal lid laxity in the patient so an elderly patient the lid is going to be lax it is going to be loose skin so this horizontal lid laxity is treated along with the wies procedure and when when both of these done and together a correction of the entropion as well as the horizontal lid laxity it is called a quickert procedure so Uh, look at the red line which is the incision for the wies procedure along with that a wedge of the inferior lid margin in the lateral one third of the lid is also taken so when you remove this wedge and suture the two ends the lid becomes tightened and the horizontal lid laxity is also corrected so that is the quickert procedure so how do you decide which procedure is to be done in which patient it basically depends on the severity of the of the entropion and patient preference if cosmesis is preferred then anterior lamellar resection will not be done if suppose the patient has horizontal lid laxity then a quickert procedure needs to be performed in addition to the wies uh, to the uh, entropion correction that you have performed so that takes care of entropion correction please let me know which other procedures you would like me to cover as always thanks for watching stay safe stay indoors good day